Dodge Division presents Extra Appeal in Charger 72. Dodge Charger has a distinct position in the Dodge lineup for 1972. It's aimed at that segment of the market represented by people who are young, or young at heart, who want a car with style and functional excellence. Charger is built to satisfy buyers who want a family-sized car, uniquely styled, and at an affordable price. And speaking of stylish, check out these concealed headlamps that are standard on all special edition Chargers and optional on other models. That's just one of the things that Charger has for 72. When you open the hood on a standard model Charger, you'll find the economical and reliable 318 V8 engine offering plenty of power while just sipping the fuel. Standard in the Charger is the column-mounted Torque Flight three-speed automatic transmission. Floor shift and manual transmission are optional. When it comes to exterior styling and sleek looks, this Charger has it all. From the looped front bumper and recessed headlamps to the optional canopy-style vinyl roof, Left-hand remote racing mirror is standard on all Charger models, while the bold and beautiful body belt moldings are optional. The rear end is just as sexy and sleek with these recessed one-piece taillights, trim accent moldings, and matching looped rear bumper. One thing to remember at Dodge, we are proud of our cars, and we show it. We offer decorative moldings, such as this, deck molding treatment package. So when you add up all the possibilities with the Charger for 72, you will have only one clear choice to make. It's Charger for 72. Now, with one more car going from grave to garage, the team can confidently ship this beautiful behemoth home to its anxiously awaiting owner. One more 72 Charger back on the road. Beneath the fog, behind the rust. Sometimes they come back. There's only one internationally recognized Mopar master, Mark Warman, joined by his friends, family, and dream team, the Ghouls. Nobody wants to take on the stuff that we take on. Reviving the past. 100% untouched survivor. Resurrecting the icons of American muscle. We are the Shaolin priests of Mopar. Uncovering stories. It's the baddest car we have here. And restoring dreams. The most iconic muscle car on the planet. Putting cars back where they belong. On the road. Here we go. Beyond a passion. Oh, that's wild. One man's obsession. <laughs> with Mopar Perfection. This is Graveyard Cars. So one of the cars that we're really getting a lot of pressure on getting wrapped up because it's taken too long is a 1970 GTX. This car is 446 barrel in EK2 orange. The funny history on this car is the guy's had it forever. He bought it from what we believe was the original owner. Somebody way back in the day decided they wanted a black GTX. So this car, when it came to me, was black all over. Somebody had blown black paint on it over that beautiful EK2. That's such a pretty color. I can't imagine putting black over the top of it, but you know, people did what they want. They made it their own car. If you go even weirder past that, this car is a factory four-speed super track pack A34 car. When it showed up, somebody had converted it to an automatic, including the console. You see a lot of people convert automatic cars over to four-speed, but you don't usually see it go the other direction. So that was kind of a weird one too. Now to put into perspective the rarity of this car, 
When you're talking about a 440 six barrel, four speed 70 GTX, 350. That's how many were made. You add to it that it's an A34 Super Track pack. You add to it that it's EK2 orange console shift car loaded with good stuff. That's a one of one car. When that car showed up, it looked like a complete 1970 GTX. We just had to go back through it starting in the basement and work our way all the way out to where we are now. It's already made it through the metal shop. Will was able to send it over to the mud room. The mud guys jumped right on and started going to town on getting all the, the smoothing done. That came out pretty quick. I think it's about 45 days now in the mud room. Back over to Will for the priming and the blocking. Then they blow it apart. They start doing the jam work put the parts back on it, and pretty much where we're at right now is final jam work on the car, final paint work. Okay, so what we're getting ready to do is get that orange base coat that I sprayed on that beautiful GTX and show you guys at home when I say it takes seven, eight coats to get coverage, it really does. So Mark's really been pressuring me to get the GTX done so that way they can get the drivetrain in it. So that gives me 10 days to paint it, let it cure, get it cut and buffed, get it washed, get it undercoated, then get it over to Mark. And just for the record, that's normally about a month's worth of work. Now, once he gets that painted, remember the drivetrain is ready to go into it. So if he can get that car done, cut, buffed, undercoated, and over to us in a reasonable amount of time, we'll be able to put the drivetrain in. Once we get the drivetrain in, and again, we got it mobile, then we can start working on ordering parts and getting it put together. So a typical Mark fashion, trying to keep me down, which he does every single day, he tried to tell me the SEMA car that I did a flawless job on wasn't covered. Not only is it not covered, it's the wrong shade, which there's no way that's even close to happening. I wasn't all that thrilled with a few of the things that I saw in the TA Chantra, which is also EK2, except they call it Go Mango over in the Dodge lineup. This is ridiculous. He never once told me anything about coverage or the shade until now. This is his way just to keep me down and try to control everything. Will has a habit of not getting enough coverage on something, and I don't want to paint this card twice. So I have asked that he goes through and does spray out cards on it. Okay, so this is our spray out card. This is the color that we did on the parts here. We're basically gonna go through coat after coat, kind of showing you how many coats it takes for coverage. And you basically just want to get enough on here to we put a light behind it. It's completely covered because if you do anything less, your car's gonna be transparent and then you'll have to reshoot the whole car. He's doing what I asked him, but he's spinning it around to make it look like he's taking it upon himself to teach you, the audience at home, how you can count the number of coats to make sure. Come on, man. Because we're only a Mopar shop, I've done probably 95% of the colors, so I know how many coats it takes. Years ago, when I first started doing this, I always sprayed the uh, color out first just to double check, but we've been doing it long enough now, I kind of know how many coats it's gonna take. I've already done this color before, I know how many coats it takes to cover, so I gotta take the time, do a spray out, take it over to him, let him look at it, and the punchline to all of it is he's completely colorblind. This is great to do if you're unsure of the color, or if you're just starting painting, or if you have any uncertainties at all, do a spray out. I mean, and a lot of people do, you know, custom shops spray stuff out, but for us being a Mopar only shop, we know already, so we don't do it, but I love these things. I've been trying to get him to do spray out cards for 20 years. He'll only do it when I ask him to do it. And so that's why we end up with problems like on the 69 Coronet that didn't have enough coverage on it because he didn't do the spray out. Well, we call him spray him again, Sam. Like play it again, Sam, spray it again, Sam. You have to repaint it because he won't follow the instructions. So you can see this is just one coat. You know, it's a pretty transparent color. This is why it takes so many. And that's a good heavy, not heavy, heavy, but that's a good wet coat. And you can see right through it. So that's why I'm getting up there to six, seven, eight coats of coverage. You know, he can't see yellow. He can't see orange, red, blue, purple, brown. I, I think it's just black and white, but whatever. So coat number one's all dry. You can tell it's not all shiny anymore. It's all flat finished. So we're ready for coat number two. So we got done with the second coat, but inside here you can still see all four colors behind the orange. So we're still not close to being covered yet. So this is coat number three, and you can still kind of see through there a couple of the lines. It's getting better, but it's still transparent. So there's four different colors behind this, and the reason for that is because 
certain colors cover faster over another color. But Mark and I have always been firm believers that you cover the whole entire card, no matter what the background is, to actually ensure that you have coverage. So that's what that's for. With four coats on there, it looks pretty covered. I mean, you can't see any of the lines behind it anymore. And a lot of people at that point would think they actually have coverage and be ready to clear it. So if you put a light behind it, you could actually see that we're still not covered. Uh, so this is coat number five. And again, you know, it looks like we got coverage, but we're not gonna be there yet. You can still see behind it. So a couple more coats and we'll be done. All right, so that was coat number six. Well, we're getting there. You can still see it slightly. So maybe one more coat and we'll be there. So as you can see, that's pretty covered. That's 100% covered all the way around. You can't see through it at all. All four shades of co are covered. So at this point, I know I have coverage. It got the seventh coat. So at that point, we're ready to clear. Mopar's always been known for the color keyed interiors. Blue interior matches the blue body or the green matches the green. They have white over different colors. My color, of course, is burnt orange, which is why you see everything laid out here. Over the years, we've done a few cars that have color keyed interiors. The West Blue 69 GTX, that was a B5 blue interior. We've had a couple of red interiors. We had the 69 Coronet RT that was a red interior years ago. We had the red Cuda from Mark and Elena, the weird tan color keyed interior from the General Lee. What we've never done is taken time to show you what those look like when they were new. A lot of guys are chasing their tails out there trying to make these interiors perfect, make sure every single piece matches every other piece. Well, bad news sports fan, they didn't. So I wanna take a minute and show everybody what they really look like and what I'm gonna do in my 70 Charger situation. If you go out back and you look at a couple of different cars, you'll see what I'm about to talk about. I have two Chargers outside. They're both burnt orange with burnt orange interiors. Look through there. Before it gets cleaned or anything else, just look through there. And you'll see that the burnt orange trim pieces like the A-pillar moldings and the knee bolsters and the center dash bolster or trim as Tony calls it, the ashtray, these are all the same color as the interior. Mopar was big on that. They loved color keying things like that. The seat belts were black, but the rest of it was all burnt orange. The carpet would be burnt orange as well. I also have the original dealership books. These are the books that you would have selected one of your cars if you were walked into a Dodge dealership in 1970 and said, I wanna take a look at the books. You have original swatches of the vinyl. You have the color charts. You have what options you can get with it, what you couldn't get with it. So it's a huge advantage when it comes to duplicating the way something was built 50 years ago. You take that, you match it up to an original coat hanger that's never seen the light of day. That's factory stuff. You pull it up to a trim that's been exposed terribly to the elements for 50 years, and this fades. But it's okay. The factory didn't match, that's the point. One panel didn't match the next panel, that's the way the manufacturer did it. Different lot runs, you ever buy two carpets, buy a carpet from one room, you try to match it a year later, they're different lot runs, they're different color dyes. So what do you wanna do on your car? You wanna do what the factory did, and that's what this is about. If you have a car that has a color keyed interior, whether it's blue or green, black wouldn't count as much because most of those all match each other, but burn orange in this case. Be okay with the fact that they didn't all match each other from the factory. They had multiple vendors. It's like carpet. It's like trying to match a paint. They use a different toner the next time they mix it up. So while they probably did match a lot better in 1970, I guarantee you that the lower dash pad knee bolster area didn't match the trim on the left-hand side of the column and it didn't match the one on the glove box. Be okay with the idea that it shouldn't all match perfectly. So if you have a car and it's an original one, 
There should be a variance from panel to panel. And if there is, it's totally fine. This is the glove box. This, while setting inside the car, will kind of be oriented like that. And you can probably see a difference in the colors. Again, it's factory color mismatch. That's fine. I don't mind the factory color mismatch. Here's an A-pillar molding. This is out of a completely different car. Hold it up to that. Can you guys see the difference in that color? It's mild, it's gonna be, it's gonna be hard to tell on TV, but believe me, there is a subtle, ever so subtle difference <laughs> between these two colors. Like you can see a difference. I'm doing a bit. This is an example of me minding my business, doing my job, trying to teach you something at home, and Will happen to stick his fat face into my business. What are you teaching? I'm teaching them how to tell color shade differences and that it's okay. It's all right if these two A-pillar moldings are out of the same car, but don't match exactly. I'm using things like my original color and trim selector. Huh. Pretty cool, right? These are all the pieces I've rounded up for my charger. Even though they're all different. Now, I'm not coming by to pick on Mark, but the idea of a colorblind guy doing a tutorial on colors is insane. What can I do for you? Oh, I was just gonna have you check a color. Yeah, I don't think the audience will mind if I stop and check the color for you. Well, if you're doing- If you need my assistance. Yeah, I'm doing stuff on an interior, but how can I help you? This is for uh, Clark's car, EK2. Just to be clear, Mark asked me to spray this out just so he would know how many coats it takes to cover. Lemon twist yellow? No. Mark is colorblind as a bat. He can't tell the difference between orange and yellow and yellow and orange. No idea. It's, a, it's closer to lemon twist yellow than it <laughs> is orange. Why is that funny to you? Because that's orange. It's closer to yellow than it is orange. What is wrong with you? It's orange. Okay, so I'm colorblind. The original books aren't. And I happen to have all of the original books, which will prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that I am right and he is wrong. Which you'll notice, look at the color. They have the top five high impact colors right here. Yeah. Let's just swing over there. Folks, is it closer to lemon <laughs> twist yellow? <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. This is ridiculous, even for Mark. The guy has completely lost his mind. Ask a question. This is where you make fun of me for being no, colorblind? I'm, I do have trouble with yellows and greens and oranges and blues and reds. I'm not making fun of you. And browns. Pretty much all colors. I'm not saying it's a perfect match. I'm saying it's closer to yellow than, where's it at? There it is. Yeah. Yeah, look, no shine on yours I haven't, at all. I haven't cleared it. Oh, it hasn't been clear coated. <laughs> yeah, who's crazy? I actually got checked a couple of years ago to make sure I wasn't crazy and they said, you're fine. Will, I'd like to see the report on him. This is real bloody. This is bright yellow. You're insane. You're crazy. You, you, this. Paint it whatever color you want. I'm going to paint it. You, you should paint it the factory color, though. This is the factory color for the car. That is not the factory. That is uh, You're crazy. banana yellow. You're crazy. Oh, you may be right. Yeah, I may be crazy. You okay? are crazy. Yeah, but it just may be a lunatic you're looking for, <laughs> right? I... Turn out the lights. Ha <laughs> ha. Don't try to save me. Ha <laughs> ha. You may be wrong. Billy Joe, you may be You may be wrong, but you may be right. You may be wrong, but you may be right. I don't know what the hell Billy Joel has to do with painting cars. I've seen all the Mark's Ridiculous over 30 years. This is a whole new level of losing his mind. He's ruined my whole rhythm. I don't even want to do it anymore. Point being, if the colors don't match each other, they don't match each other. Nobody cares. And I'm the ice tray. I said it officially. So after my dad got the color code dialed in for the 1970 GTX and the amount of coats I'm going to need, I'm getting ready to go in there and jam it. Dodge Division presents Extra Appeal in Charger for 1972. Dodge Charger has a distinct position in the Dodge lineup for 1972. Its aim is for that segment of the market represented by the young or young at heart that want to look cool and always make the scene. For the folks that don't care how they look and probably sit around the house all day in a bathrobe and slippers watching reruns of Star Trek, there's the all-new heap from Chevrolet, the Malibu. A painfully boring, boxy-looking car that offers no style, no individuality, and you're sure your grandmother would love it. But if style, class, and individuality matter to you, seek out your local Dodge dealer and put a Dodge in your garage today.
So I'm getting ready to do the jam work on the doors and fenders, and it is a base coat clear coat, so it'll take at least seven coats of color to cover it all, and then followed by clear. After that, on the upper door frames, it'll go two-tone black. So over the past couple years that Brody's been here, every car that he does, I give him more responsibility uh, paint work wise. It's super important to do the jam work really nice because he'll be doing the outside of these cars one day and he's learning that. So like right now I have him in the booth doing the two-tone on the GTX doors. Gun time is, is crucial. And while Brody may not understand two years ago why he was at epoxing every single car, it seemed repetitive, it puts a gun in his hand and it actually t shows him how to fine tune the gun, how to spray, and just work on little things. So when it comes time to spraying color, he's got a good handle on it. So we're doing the inside of the doors black because the interior of the car is black. If the interior of the car was blue, we'd be spraying the doors blue but we're doing it black with the orange, got a nice Halloween look to it, and it really pops. So when it comes to Brody Spring, he's doing such a great job. I have him doing a lot of the jam work now. And one of the most like instant payoffs is when we do a two-tone on the door jam. So you have the black on there with the orange, and those two contrasts, they really pop and they really look beautiful. Coming up, Mark races to recreate his very first Mopar. I'm going to try to have almost every component to the car completely detailed and on the shelf by the time we're done with the body and paint. A 1970 Dodge Charger in FK5 burnt orange. If you're building one of these cars at home and you want to do it right, good luck without doing it with the right paints. But will the car he remembers match with reality? What we've ended up with in the past is shinier than it should be. Mark escalates the intensity. Go back that way, an eighth of an inch. Poquito, poquito. When he and Dougie install the drivetrain in a newly painted GTX, will Dougie be pushed too far when his cousin goes soft in the head? He's lost his mind. Find out when Graveyard Cars returns. I wouldn't watch it. This 1970 Plymouth Duster left the Los Angeles assembly plant July 24th of 1970. For the record, that was the last week of production for the 1970 model year. Amazingly enough, it still retains its original engine, transmission, and interior. It's also the topic of this week's autopsy report. Okay, remember we read fender tags bottom to top, left to right. So our first code is E55. That's a 340 high performance engine. D32, heavy duty, three speed automatic transmission. VS29, V stands for Valiant Series, S stands for Special Price Class, and 29 stands for two door hardtop. H0E, H stands for 340. Zero represents 1970, which was the model year, and E represents the assembly plant, which was Los Angeles. 159247. That is the unique serial number for this car. Now we go up a line and start on the left. EV2, Tor Red. L6X9. Now remember, this is in regards to the interior trim. So L is gonna stand for low price class, six is gonna stand for vinyl bucket seats, and X9 is gonna stand for black. TX9, upper door trim black, 724. That stands for July 24th, 1970, which was the scheduled production date for this car. As I mentioned earlier, that was the very last week of production for the 1970 model year. 195340. That is the shipping order number for this car. And you can also find that on the broadcast sheet or the window sticker. Okay, and now we go up to our third line. EV2, that is the roof paint and that's Tor Red. A01, light group. A62, 
Rally Instrument Cluster, A88 Interior Decor Group, C16 Center Console, C55 Bucket Seat. Okay, we go up to our fourth line, G36 Left and Right Outside Racing Mirrors, J81. Woohoo! Now that is a rare option. That is a rear spoiler. L31 Turn Signal Indicators. M21 drip rail moldings. N41 dual exhaust. N95 evaporative emissions. So basically, they call these a California car. Now we go up to our top and final row. R11 AM Music Master Radio. V6X black longitudinal stripes. V8X black transverse stripes. Y14 that indicates it's a sold car, meaning someone special ordered it. END, that represents the end of the sales code and the end of this week's autopsy report. When comparing the beautiful, bold, new styling of the Charger for 72 to the ancient and basic styling of the Malibu for 72, the first thing you'll notice are the outside door handles and front end treatment. The Charger uses a flush mount handle that lifts up with ease, where the Dinosaur bow tie uses the same thumb push handles as the 1965 Rambler Marlin. The Charger grille and looped front bumper are futuristic and functional. The recessed dual headlights and low mounted turn signals will be protected from damage and they add a sleek and sporty look. The block of cheese Malibu has single headlights and front turn signals that are not only ugly, but vulnerable to breakage when grandma bumps into the shopping carts. That's really sad, dude. Fun fact, the Marlin was voted one of the ugliest cars to come out of Detroit. This is the dash frame for my 70 Charger. I've already done all the body work to it. I did all the provisions for my little aftermarket 8-track. So the way I'm doing my Charger is I'm gonna try to have almost every component to the car completely detailed and on the shelf by the time we're done with the body and paint. This gets covered with plastic. All of my interior plastic trim is being redone by instrument specialties. All the gauges are out being redone by instrument specialties. I didn't want any aftermarket stuff on my dash. I wanted all factory parts. All of this area gets painted burn orange. On the top, you'll see the provisions, the liberties as Tony D'Agostino would say. Here you see I have cutouts for the three speaker dash on both sides and I will lock this down and spin it around. So one of the things that you're gonna notice about this car as I'm building it is I'm doing it away from the OE that I normally preach about because this is my car and I want it to be the way it was when I had it and drove it and enjoyed it. So you're gonna see things like an aftermarket Craig eight track tape player mounted underneath the dash. I saved up my money and bought Kmart fog lights. Super cool, super cool. Let's see, I put five slot mags on it. I did tuck and roll, velvet interior. I made the car my own. Everything that I did, I made my own. The things that I didn't have that I wanted was like a three speaker dash, air conditioning. So I'm adding those. I'm even adding power windows because I'm old and lazy now. Check these little mother biscuits right here. These little three things are called thread setters. You recall me talking about my Craig 8 track that my uncle gave me? Well, I didn't do anything this sanitary back in the day, but I custom built an eight track bracket for the player, which is new old stock, put my thread setters in, and now look at that. Nice provision here I've made right here for that one, because that's a factory piece that holds up one of the vents to the AC, so I had to have that hole still available there. All of the provisions are now made that I can move forward with painting this. So the paint that I use on the metal pieces of the dash and the interior are different than the material that I use on my dash pad, which I'll show you in a minute. The product that goes on here originally was a lacquer finish with a toner called suede. So, you know, every once in a while in our crazy business, we learn something new or we get a new vendor. We have found a paint that is duplicating what was done originally. So originally, like the interiors of these cars, all of the metal, it had 
a lacquer that had a suede in it, gave it a very coarse texture. If you were dealing with the garnish moldings and the surround mold, peripheral moldings, they had a low gloss finish, but again, they were lacquer. Lacquer's gone. The suede was gone long before even the lacquer was gone. What we've ended up with in the past is shinier than it should be. 877 for paint one. Go ahead and write it down. You see it on can. I don't care. The other piece that goes on here is the handle for the ashtray and the actual ashtray itself. I'm gonna be painting both sides of that. That's why I have it suspended. This is the dash pad. See, I have areas on the back here that I wanna make sure I hit when I do this. That's why it's up on the suspended rack that I built. This all gets wiped down with wax and grease, which I already did. Again, these are very special paints and that's why I shamelessly plug the company because if you're building one of these cars at home and you wanna do it right, good luck without doing it with the right paints. The metal paint is different than the plastic and vinyl paint, has a different finish to it, as I mentioned before. The reductions are the same. They're a four to one with a reducer, but the application of it, the temperature of it, those are different. Now I'm doing all the parts in the booth today, but I'm gonna do them at separate times. The first thing I'm gonna work on are the metal pieces. Once I got all of the metal dash pieces painted on the car, remember that's a different material and a different finish than the vinyl. I can move on to the vinyl and the plastic and do them now. I've got the dash pad. This is an original 69 to 70 Dodge Charger dash pad. This just in mint condition. Pretty rigid stuff. I wanted to soften it up. I've already gone over it twice with my adhesion promoter. I wanna go over it one more time so you can see how it works. What we're gonna get out of there is a sponge that's soaked in all kinds of good stuff. We're gonna wipe this thing down. I've already gone over it, like I say, several times, but because it's pretty old vinyl, I want it to stick. You guys know me, I'm crazy when it comes to my car. Like I mentioned before, I'm not a huge fan of dying parts because they can get bumped and they can scratch and they can lose their adhesion. It's hard to get paint to stick to plastic and vinyl, but it's also sometimes all you have. In this particular case, it's the best we could do, which is an original dash pad that isn't cracked, a real peach of a dash pad, and then reproduction dash vents because they're always busted out because they're plastic. These are good quality reproduction and they take dye well. So it's the second best thing to new old stock. It's not exactly the car, but it will look exactly like the car. That's what the tray does. Once Brody finished all the jam work, which he did, and it came out great, at this point, we give it back to the body men so they can put the panels on it and we can get it ready for final paint. So once I finished the car, we let it sit in the booth for a couple days, curing out. Once that was done, I gave it to Anthony to start the cut and buff process. So what you see Anthony doing right now is he's uh, hitting it with the 3000. It's the final step before we buff. What he did before that was long block it with 1000 grit, 1500 grit, 2000 grit. Then he hits the 3000, which just gets all the little imperfections out. And then that makes it really easy to buff. All right, Doug's getting the rest of the fasteners ready here. Just to give you a quick rundown one more time on the rear ends, a few things. This right here, these four mounting areas, this is the leaf spring mounting perch, and it'll go through these holes here. One of our biggest goals is always to get the drivetrain under a car, because once you do that, you can put the wheels and tires on it, put the torsion bars in it. So that is what I'm working on with Dougie today. That goes into there, and we put the captive style Keps nuts on the back of it. We like to put the shocks in first, 
because you can see the bolts are way up here high. Those are a little bit difficult to get to. So if they're in place now, all you have to do is snug them down once you get the rear end in. At the back, you've got your shackle, which is this little job right here. This goes into the shackle, this goes into the frame like that right there, and that suspends everything. So we start by bringing it in and installing the leaf spring purchase first. Now, does that sound good to you? That is correct. Good. Well, I appreciate your help on this thing. That's very nice. Will has done a great job getting the car over. This new sense of urgency that he's working under is working out well for me. Okay, let's put that mammer jammer in there. Try to get these as tight as humanly possible so human hands can't move them later, okay? Thank okay. you, do the best. <laughs> All right. Anything you need, Mark. I'm here okay. for you, buddy. All right. right. I believe that. You believe that, don't you? I absolutely believe it. I love working on these cars. I really do. I only get worried when I'm working with Mark. Don't get me wrong. We work really well together, unless the cameras are on. And when we're filming, I don't know what's going to happen. All right. Look at that. It <laughs> fell in. That's the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. M-O-O-N. That spells your in, huh, Dougie? Yeah. Thinking about remaking that movie. And... The race to the nut house begins now. Which movie? The Stand. The Stand. What are you going to call it? The Rear End Stand. Starring Dougie Oldham as Tom Collins and Mark Warman as Stu Redman. Why do I have to be Tom Collins? I haven't seen the movie. But if M-O-O-N spells everything Mark says it does, I don't want to be Tom. I like it. Does that sound it's got a nice ring to it? I wouldn't watch it. You wouldn't watch it? Uh-uh. If your cousin made a motion oh. picture. Oh, well, of course I'd watch that one, Mark. I'm just trying to lighten the mood. You don't know how difficult that is with Dougie Collins. Could you hand me a ratchet while you're at it? Yeah. They're on your left. Okay. On the shelf. Okay. <laughs> That wasn't too bad. You know, Tom Collins used to like mannequins, too. Oh, I got one. Group of kids from Glenwood, right, mostly criminals, go on this journey to find a dead body. There's this cousin, Dougie, is dead. Me? And they go on a journey, yeah. You killed me? It's called The Stand by Me. Coming up, it's high tension in assembly. Installing the drivetrain is very intense. When Mark and Dougie coordinate the engine install into a freshly painted GTX. I'm on a 20,000 pound forklift. How am I supposed to know what an eighth of an inch looks like from here? Can cousin Dougie keep up with Mark's escalating demands? He's lost his mind. That was 730 seconds. <laughs> Find out when Graveyard Cars returns. Now you have a gaga. For our final comparison of the Charger, new for 72, and the I drove my Chevy to the levee, but the levee was dry Malibu for 72. Let's have a look at the interior. The Charger features high back bucket seats with a plush yet sporty design and integrated headrests. The door trim panels are equally plush and sporty and feature a simulated wood grain insert. The Malibu has an ugly low back bucket seat with adjustable headrests and very little style and comfort. The trim panels are plain and a touch macabre. You would see the same pattern in a hearse or a taxi. So folks, when you add up the tape for the Charger versus the Malibu, there's just one clear choice, Charger. For the rest of you who insist on driving a funeral car to the drive-in to watch Corvette summer with your nerd friends, remember what Vince Lombardi said. Show me a good loser, and I'll show you a loser. Yes, we realize Corvette Summer didn't come out until 1978. We were just going for the insult. I do not want my audience at home to think that I've flipped out and I've completely turned my back on OEM. I love OEM, I got a shop full of it. I know OEM. But man, look at that engine, right, for the GTX. It just brings back so many memories of Mickey Thompson valve covers and Holly this, and you walk around that engine and you look at it, and it does have every bit that feel that we had. You guys see that little bolt right there? Yeah. Well, I was talking to the audience. This is an original bolt. 
right here with the end you see we have restored it put black phosphate on it We've got two of those two more on the other side this bolt goes up in this cavity right here and gets threaded in just like that we'll have one in the front one in the back same thing on the other side this bolt goes up through the K member right here pinches the K member between the frame rail and the K member itself and that's the goal that's the objective that's our mission should we decide to accept it you decided to accept it Doug yeah raise that mother biscuit up think she'll start Arnie well yeah if you turn the key it will oh hey okay go ahead and go up about three feet shift it to your right one inch another inch Okay, go straight up. Go ahead and tip it forward. I'm gonna line up the trajectory of that rail. Okay, that's it right there. Go straight up. So installing the drivetrain is very intense. It's a close fit between the engine and the inner fenders and the firewall. I've learned that in this particular formula, it's better if I am on the ground watching and guiding and Doug runs the controls on the forklift. Shift it that way an eighth of an inch. An eighth of an inch? I'm on a 20,000 pound forklift with seven foot forks. How am I supposed to know what an eighth of an inch looks like from here? Oh my God, that wasn't an eighth of an inch. My God, that was not an eighth. M-O-O-N spells eighth of an inch. Go back that way, an eighth of an inch. Poquito, poquito. <laughs> okay, straight up. Okay, keep going. Back up one inch. A real one inch? That was not one inch. This is what I don't understand. Why is Tom having such difficulty with fractions? One sixteenth, one eighth, a millimeter if you want to go. That can kill somebody. Here we go, going up one inch. I didn't say go up one inch, I said go up. Oh. Just go up, go up. Going up. Hang on. Come forward. That way? Five sixteenths of an inch. How would I know what 5 sixteenths of an inch is like this? He's lost his mind. That was 7.30 seconds. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I thought this was easy. Go ahead and come in just a hair more, another 7.30 seconds. Right there, up, uh, now, <laughs> that was a bigger fraction. Back up a pube. Stop it. You're killing me. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful job. You like that? Take her easy, Chief. I'll be right back. So we have all four bolts in the K-member, exactly where they're supposed to be. Next is the transmission cross-member installation. Okay, he's going to finish putting in the transmission cross-member. Then we'll put the torsion bars in, marry the knuckle to the upper control arm, put the shocks on, let it down, and put wheels on it. So remember that song, Rollin'? Rollin', rollin', rollin'. Keep them doggies rollin'. Doggies? Hide. That's Mr. Roboto. Domo erigato, Mr. Robato. Domo erigato, Mr. Robato. Domo. 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 It's only two domos, dude. I don't care. On time and on schedule, this one of one 1970 GTX 446 barrel is complete. On its way into assembly and then back on the road.